Um, thank you very much to all panelists who are here with us today, to the audience and to the people who are following us and watching us online. Uh, today we'll, in this panel we'll discuss the vulnerable position of the activists and also engaged citizens in the entire Western Balkans uh, as we have uh, witnessing direct um, uh, physical attack uh, in the Europe Pride but also uh, slap, um, slap abusing cases against the activists and journalists has been used to silence the activists in the entire region and it's, I think it's very important also the momentum to talk about this, this cases and also to, uh, to send a message that we should uh, continue in our dialogue uh, among activists even though that the current uh, political situation is going on between Kosovo and Serbia as we should look for an alternative spaces to, to discuss and to, to, to see uh, to reimagine our future maybe. So uh, firstly I want uh, shortly to, to, uh, to mention about the Engaged Democracy Initiative. Yeah, this initiative is, is actually, uh, is actually is based to engage activists, to bring them together uh, on the base same values and to, to, to enforce, enforce their, their links among researcher activists and also scholars based, uh, based on their work on the democratization, social and just accountability of institution and to empower their, their links uh, there are things that are that are based on the preventing and promoting so solidarity and democracy. I want also to share shortly uh, that the in framework of EDI, there have been organized thematic organi uh, uh, thematic meetings in all capital cities, except in Kosovo. That's why this meeting is actually taking place now in Pristina. And maybe also to, to have the opportunity to say that, that the second EDI convention will take place in, in Pristina in May, that will gather engaged activists, uh, also researcher and academia to talk together and to see, uh, to see how we can, uh, we can strengthen uh, the links with, among activists. Um, as in the, here in the panel, we have all the women activists who are actually fighting uh, for the democratic values and are in the front, uh, front line. I also want to, uh, to express our solidarity with the activists uh, now, with the women activists now in Iran who are fighting the front line for their rights. Even though not in every time uh, uh, they are covered from the media or, or are in the media spotlight and also in the political discussion, but I think it's very important their message they are sending to the world and it is very important to say that we are standing with them in solidarity. So not taking too much time, I want to, um, to just shortly present uh, the fellow panelists that are today with us here and I, am, I feel very privileged to, to moderate this, uh, this discussion and I think it's very, very important to have these, these kind of meetings more and to dis discuss this, uh, these issues. So I will start from uh, Flutra Kusari, she's very well known and prominent activist in Kosovo. So she's member of the steering committee of the anti-slab coalition in Europe and senior advisor of Euro, Europe, European Center for Press and Media Freedom. I want also to, uh, to tell that Milica Andri Rakic uh, unfortunately could not uh, join the, uh, the panel even though, I mean, she was part of the, of the panel. Um, Jenny Kraya, uh, uh, Karaya, she is, uh, she is from Alliance Against Discrimination of LGBTI, and uh, Tara Petrovic from Civic Initiative. Uh, so I will follow with a question to the old panelists and then we'll ho have an open discussion with the audience. Uh, so I, 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 I will use an opportunity to start with uh, Flutra and maybe to tell a little bit more uh, um, about the slap cases and how been, have been used so far to silence activists and journalists. As we saw there are many cases in Kosovo but in the entire, uh, entire region. And also uh, what have been done at the European level against the slap cases and what what is the experience of Kosovo in this regard? Um, thank you very much. This is working, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here uh, today with you and to talk about slaps. It's an important topic, and uh, of course, I'm delighted to to see that this topic is finding forums to be discussed also in in Kosovo. Um, uh, strategic lawsuits against public participation. The acronym is SLAPS. Um, stands for legal claims which aim at uh, intimidating and also threatening uh, by using and abusing legislation and legal proceedings against journalists, activists, human rights defenders, civil society organizations and all those who use public participation for their activism or other types of 
um, um, uh, activities. Now, SLAPs target mainly journalists, according to the data collected by the case, which is the European Anti-SLAP Coalition. However, these data do not reflect all the cases because we believe that a lot of activists especially from um, different communities and um, find difficulties in speaking publicly about uh, such legal threats. Uh, but the data we have collected, uh, they concern uh, mainly journalists. Now, of course, the question is what are these uh, um, uh, claims and why they have become a problem? Um, killing um, an activist, killing a journalist, or physically attacking them has always been one of the strategies that has been used regularly everywhere in the world. In some uh, uh, more developed country, less so, but still they have been used. We know that in the last few years, at least five journalists have been killed in, uh, within uh, member states of the European Union, but we also know that other activists have been uh, killed. Recent case we have in Slovakia, I think you'll also uh, uh, cover. Um, uh, but the, this ta tactic um, has not been very uh, successful because um, even though, as you know, you kill the messenger, the news, the information makes it publicly. So it's not very convenient for criminals around the, the world to invest money and time in killing journalists. We know this from Daphne Caruana Galicia in Malta, who was assassinated, but her, but her stories became, uh, got more attraction publicly after she was assassinated. So the whole idea of killing her, uh, hoping that her stories will go away and will, will uh, be buried al along uh, with, with her, didn't play out very well. So all these powerful people who want to use money and uh, power to um, intimidate those who speak publicly, those who reveal information in the public interest, they had to come up with new strategies and new ideas. So one of the strategies was why not hire lawyers, bad, horrible lawyers, and I repeat this, horrible, bad lawyers who don't mind filing baseless lawsuits against activists and journalists, dragging them into courts for years, making them invest money and invest time discouraging them from being active in the public life um, with lawsuits. It's a strategy that is being used across Europe, across the, the globe, but we work in, in Europe, so I'm referring to, to Europe, and it has an impact, unfortunately. Because if you are an individual uh, um, activist, let's take the case of Adriatic Kazaferi and Spresa Loshai, and you're sued by Kelkos, who, uh, which is a company that runs uh, hydropowers uh, in, in Kosovo, and you're asked to pay 100,000 euros for criticizing them based on facts and based on observations. What is supposed to happen? Clear. Please find me one person in the Chan who dares to say a single word against Kelkos. Spresa is away and Adriatic is busy with other stuff and I recently I don't hear any criticism about Kelkos because that's the impact. You sue them, it doesn't matter what happens with the lawsuit. The message is, this is what will happen to you if you criticize a powerful company like Kelkos. The same is with, with activists. So what happens is you're sued for defamation, for defaming uh, uh, or damaging a reputation of a company or of a politician, and you're asked millions. PDK sued Bern and is asking 2 million euros for one of the best investigators investigative stories that they run, showing how public money was used in order to uh, lobby for the decision, for the idea of former uh, president um, regarding the territories of, 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 of Kosovo. Now, the impact is very damaging because it does not matter what happens with the case in 10 years' time. The message is that you need to hire lawyers, you need to invest time, you have to represent yourself in, in court and to convince the judge that what you published was based on facts. And the message, so for Bern that shouldn't be a problem. They are a big media organization and that's okay. But imagine a media outlet with three to five journalists who are doing 
good, responsible journalist, uh, journalism, and they are sued. Of course, if this happens repeatedly, then the, the, the result will be that they will think three times whether to write anything about PDK or Kelkos or, or others. And we have these cases increasing. We have not, and these cases are not only present here in, 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 in Kosovo, but also across region. Crick is one of the very good media and um, investigative uh, investigative media in in Serbia and they are regularly facing with with slaps now the question is of course how do you identify a slap um, there are several indicators how you can uh, uh, identify whether a, a lawsuit is a slap or not. Now, before I go through these indicators, and they are, these are very, very important because one of the risks is that, of course, people will also use our campaign um, on, on anti-slap. There will be people who will think, oh, why not call every single defamation lawsuit a slap? And this is wrong and this should not happen. Because if a journalist, if an activist is saying a lie, a pure lie, which is not based on facts, if a journalist is reporting a false story, they should be held responsible. And those who have been defamed should have the right to access the, the courts and, and uh, find and use remedies. But um, uh, the, the idea of slaps is uh, just countering those powerful business persons women or uh, men, politicians, and those who have enough financial resources to go after journalists and activists just because they don't like them or just because it causes them reputational damage. Now, if you are, in, if you are holding power and you do ro wrong uh, actions, you, you, every journalist and every activist has the right to damage the reputation of these persons in, in power. If you are a criminal, we should have the right to say you are a criminal. If you are corrupt, we should have the right to say you are corrupt. But this should be based on facts and based on responsible activism and, and journalism. Now, with regard to the indicators, very briefly, um, how do we identify a slap? So first, the claimant, the person that is suing, usually tries to exploit an economic advantage. We're, we're speaking here about people who are, who are either uh, rich or they are able to collect money collect money very quickly and I say I'm using the second uh, 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 description to um, describe for example priests in Romania we have a very big problem with priests who have been sued who have been uh, 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 um, accused of, of uh, sexually harassing minors. And now every time a journalist reports about them, they sue journalists. These are not uh, 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 very um, uh, rich uh, people, but they are able to collect money in a very short period of time and then use that money against activists and, and journalists. So in cases of slaps, you'd have people who are very uh, uh, powerful, rich, or the, with the possibility of collecting money. Secondly, uh, the arguments that are used uh, by the, the person who is suing, by claimant, are either not funded uh, at all, have no foundation, or they are partially funded. What does it mean? It might be that a journalist will report a, a groundbreaking investigative story and that in that story there, will, there might be mistakes. These mistakes very often are because of lack of transparency. Now what do you do? You sue them for these mistakes? No, you use other bodies, self-regulatory bodies, etc., in order to ask for an apology, for a correction, etc. You don't sue a media outlet for a minor mistake and asking two million euros. And the same is also with, uh, uh, with uh, activists. The remedies which are sought are usually uh, not proportionate. What does it mean? This is the case of Bern. If you ask two million euros for a media company, um, uh, the message is very clear. Uh, we want to shut you down forever and we want to send a message to others. This is what happens if you write against, in this case, PDK or whoever uh, 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 files the, the, the lawsuit. And then the last point, it's a long list. Um, the lawsuits usually um, uh, uh, target individuals. 
and not the media company. And one example of this in, in Kosovo is Saranda Romai. She has around 10 lawsuits in total around 1 million euros um, uh, request for damages, uh, compensation and, and damages. And of course, you, you know all, I think Saranda, so for those who don't know, she is one of the best invest, investigative journalists we have in, in, in Kosovo. And uh, at, at some point uh, she told me that of course it has become quite, uh, quite an amount, quite uh, difficult for her to keep up, keep up just with judicial proceedings because you have to respond and you have to go to court, etc. And instead of uh, her uh, focusing on 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 what is what she's supposed to do, which is investigative stories, she has to go to, to the court, and that's the purpose of, of, of this. So I'll I'll conclude this part of, of my intervention by saying that the situation is. Um, it's not good, and there is enough data to show that there is, uh, uh, this is a problem across Europe, including our, our country and our region. But there are some positive mo um, uh, developments in order to counter stuff, but I think we will address them later. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, for also for your in intervention. Um, here I just want to, to pause that it's very important to have the clear definition of the uh, slap cases as, as it can be also misused and used a lot and also it can carry it as a boomerang also against the activists. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so here I, I, I want to continue with, uh, uh, with Tara and we, we saw that there is a rise of the also slap cases also in Serbia and also Flutra mentioned the cases of the investigative outlet of Crick. So if you, if you can say some words about the uh, this uh, particular example, but also the situation in Serbia um, uh, regarding to the slap uh, suitcase, uh, slap law uh, lawsuits. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, and um, uh, I'm I'm very glad to be here talking about this issue. I I also think it's it's very important, and I think that that in our region specifically, there may not be enough awareness that we're just now um, becoming aware. Um, of, of the growing threat that uh, this poses. Uh, when it comes to Serbia, I would feel comfortable saying that at this point we're um, in what can be described as an epidemic of, of slap cases. Um, according to uh, research by the uh, Independent Journalist Association of Serbia, the first um, moment where we've seen an uptick in slap cases um, in Serbia specifically was 2020, but what I would define as sort of the watershed moment, and I think it's illustrative of, of what we're um, dealing with right now, would be um, in April 2021 when a construction company, Millennium Team, uh, filed 11, simultaneously 11 lawsuits against um, different media, uh, some bigger media outlets, but also small civil society media where journalists don't even take a salary. And they demanded um, 100,000 euros or 200,000 euros in, in some cases from um, each party that was sued and the basis of their lawsuit was that all of this these media had completely accurately um reprinted, reported on a press uh, conference by an opposition party uh, where it was alleged that the construction company um had um was involved in, in some sort of corruption and um, so um, after that, that was in April 2021, I think two weeks later we had a very similar lawsuit from um, another private company against an investigative journalist outlet in, in Vojvodina and so on. Um, but what I think is indicative about this case um, is that uh, following public pressure, this is what really uh, got um, slaps um, on the agenda of, of civil society and media in Serbia, um, and following public pressure, Millennium Team, they, they said that um, they were go going to do a, a magnanimous gesture, they, they were going to do something very nice, and they lowered their claim to 100 euros per person. And I think they feel that what they did um, was a good deed. Um, but it actually just lays bare the what slaps are at their core, which is that um, there were never any damages, never any real damages that they were seeking to compensate. It was about abusing the process and about using the judicial system as a weapon against um, critical voices. 
Um, obviously, uh, journalists aren't the, the only ones uh, targeted. Um, activists have, have been faced with a growing number of slap lawsuits. Um, in Serbia, that's particularly the case with environmental activists. I mean, it's uh, the case globally as well, but um, since uh, environmental issues and um, misconduct by private companies in partnership with state authorities have um, been a growing concern in Serbia, that's um, where um, repression has has also appeared. Um, apart from uh, the case I already mentioned in Krik, which, which uh, I will get to, I would also like to highlight um, some other cases against activists. For example, we have, um, these are proceedings that are currently ongoing. Um, activist um, from Novi Pazar, Aladin Paucinets, he has around, and I'll explain why I'm saying around, 15 um, lawsuits against him, some criminal, some uh, civil. Um, which were, uh, which are all um, from the same plaintiff, who is the acting director of the general hospital in Novi Pazar, uh, because during the height of the COVID epidemic, the mortality rate in Novi Pazar was was very high, and citizens were dissatisfied with how the uh, health authorities were uh, managing the crisis. So they organized daily protests, which carried on for months in front of the hospital, and then the uh, acting uh, director of the hospital sued every single person who spoke out publicly, including doctors who signed a petition for his dismissal and one patient who posted on Facebook about his experiences in the hospital. Um, so Aladdin has, um, just against him, um, around 15 lawsuits. Um, some are uh, civil, some are criminal, because the Serbian legal system allows for criminal insult and then allows for financial claims for compensation on top of that uh, criminal lawsuit. Um, the um, plaintiff, Meho Mahmutovic, his lawyers were able to s stack all of those lawsuits, one um, on top of another. I say around because... Um, Aladdin is being represented uh, by a colleague of ours from Lawyers Committee Group for uh, Human Rights. And um, even um, the, the plaintiff, Mehu Mahmutovic's lawyer, uh, is not able to answer the question of how many lawsuits he currently has pending, uh, just because of, of, of the sheer number. He can't even keep, keep track of them. Um, so um, the um, lawsuits against Aladdin are based on a Facebook posts he made, the things he said at the protest, uh, and there are uh, 15 different cases pending. Uh, because um, Novi Pazar is, is such a such a small uh, environment, uh, and because uh, unlike media cases, those are handled by uh, local courts, um, the outcome of these cases, which have been going on since 2020, are heavily dependent on just the, the judge who's who's presiding over. So we've had some cases, they're all, it's the same factual basis. Um, it's the same criticism, it's the same Facebook posts, but depending on which judge is presiding over, um, some cases were dismissed and Aladdin was convicted in some of them and the total amount he's financially potentially liable for is millions of uh, dinar. Um, additionally, we've had one um, especially worrying case which is ongoing against an environmental activist, um, Dragana Arsic, who's uh, active uh, on uh, raising awareness on um, some illegal building in um, a protected area in, in northern Serbia. Uh, and uh, the owners of a company um, she's been outspoken against have filed criminal charges against her for uh, damaging their credit rating and business reputation, which is a crime that uh, exists in the Serbian criminal code. Um, and they're asking for a year in prison um, for... Um, just to, to punish her for, for things she's uh, said about uh, their business. Um, and as well as they have four other lawsuits pending against her colleagues and they're also demanding millions in financial compensation. Um, so this case, because it's also um, handled by a local court uh, in Novi Sad, it's, um, it's been, the pr court proceedings have been marked with uh, various issues. We've had journalists be ejected from the courtroom trying to report on this case. 
Um, so there's, it's still ongoing, and uh, it's a very big question, even though it's it's completely baseless, how it's going to um, end. And that um, brings me to to the case against Greek. Um, if, for those who aren't aware, Tito already mentioned that they're um, very, um, they're award-winning. They they just recently got a EU award, investigative portal from Serbia that reports on uh, crime and corruption. Um, they have, at present, I think, 10 um, slap cases against them, uh, and the um, uh, cumulative number of uh, the amount they're being asked to pay in compensation for all of these lo lawsuits is three times their annual budget. So it's um, financially exhausting, it's emotionally exhausting, it's, it's very stressful. And they've just recently received um, the first um, sort of negative outcome, the, the, the first decision where they are being held liable in one of these cases. Um, thankfully, it's um, only a first instance verdict. There seems a, a very real, real chance of it being overturned um, on appeal. Um, but uh, the reason why it's worrying is these previous cases uh, I've mentioned, which have ended poorly for activists despite the lawsuits being baseless, they've been handled by uh, local courts, um, while this is in front of the higher court in Belgrade, and this is according to the law on information and media, according to which uh, all other media lawsuits are held. So it represents a very uh, dangerous precedent. Um, the case uh, itself is um, that they're being sued um, by Bratislav Gacic, who was, uh, at the time their article was um, published, he was uh, head of the Serbian Security Intelligence Agency and who is now the uh, Minister uh, of the Interior. Um, and uh, the reason why uh, um, they're being sued for reporting accurately from um, a, a court proceeding um, on what was said in a wiretap conversation that was uh, presented as evidence in the court. And, um, and I'll just uh, finish with this. Um, the verdict itself, why um, it represents such a dangerous precedent, is that the argumentation that's being used by the judge um, in the decision is that um, the fact that Gashic is a um, high public official uh, who is um, at the head of the security angels agency and um, it's within his competence to combat crime and corruption, that for that reason, uh, Krik's accurate reporting on um, him potentially being implied in criminal activity is damaging to his reputation, so he's entitled to emotional damages. So that's a very, very dangerous person. Thank you very much, Tara. I think that the, 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 the cases that you raised will be also very important for the discussion afterwards. I want also to give now the floor to Jenny, uh, as the club uh, located those views are not the only cases to silence the activists. And we saw that there were attacks uh, against uh, against activists and uh, physical and verbal attacks, especially to uh, LGBTIQ activists. So you are one of the very prominent activists in Albania, and if you can share with us your experience, challenges, uh, main challenges uh, in Albania. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm not an expert on, on slap cases. Actually, for me, it was very illuminating to listen to Dura and to Tara. Uh, it's a phenomenon actually that it's seen a lot in Albania uh, as well in the in the recent two years at least. And uh, I have many colleagues, many friends that are journalists and are are, are really like. Uh, victims of, of these cases now. We even had a law uh, on Albania made by the government, DG Perspifian, I don't know how it's in a defamation, that was very problematic and it actually uh, the aim of this law was to make possible this kind of, uh, of processes to be more easy for the government. Um, but uh, I, I can say from my experience as an LGBTI activist that when the democracy is shrinking, and we see all around the world and in our region more than ever that democracy is really shrinking, you can see that governments become very creative on finding ways how to repress activists, journalists, and everyone that has a voice and wants to raise, use their voice. 
uh, I can say that, um, uh, for example, one, uh, one structure that has been used and introduced mostly by Putin in 2012 has been the introducing of anti-LGBTI laws. Uh, and it's 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 uh, it's a, a tactic for me like very similar to the one we were talking before, and, and it's a tactic that uh, start by not allowing uh, gay propaganda for being presented as not allowing gay, gay propaganda in television or in textbooks, but actually the aim of that is you know to 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 target LGBTI activists to uh, arrest LGBTI activists when they do public events and and to shrink the, the possibility for civil society to be stronger and also it's very important to be said that because sometimes other human rights activists say okay they are coming uh, for the LGBTI activists and it's okay because unfortunately even inside civil society many times we have people that are not as open as, as they should be and uh, as solidar with other cases uh, and issues, but you know, it's not only about the weakest. If they come for us first, be sure they are going to come for women later, they are going to come for journalists, and they are going to come for, for everyone that has and wants to use their voice. And we saw that this kind of tendency was perceived uh, initially as something that was just uh, something that belonged to Russia or something that belonged to that region without thinking how fast this kind of, of autocracies travel and how fast they inspire as well other other countries and we saw how fast it, it went to Pol Poland and we saw there uh, not only the introducing of this law but also the introducing of gay natural zones that it's like unthinkable for a EU country to, to, to introduce these kinds of initiatives and we saw what happened now with Orban in Hungary with the uh, 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 the, uh, deleting textbooks uh, that that have information on LGBT rights, and um, the last we saw and I witnessed myself, unfortunately, was what happened in uh, Serbia, and I've been going there for many years now to support uh, my my fellow uh, colleagues and activists there. And uh, it's not only about the attack that happened to us and to many others, it's about the whole uh, toxic environment and the political situation there. It's the fact that uh, everything that happened was inspired and justified by government and by the religious groups there and also by the media, unfortunately. Uh, it, it was like a, a game being played between all these components uh, and uh, the effect uh, and, and what happened, the consequences were suffered by the LGBTI community at large and some of us that were beaten and it, it, it was more, uh, more, more direct. And you can see how dangerous it is when governments that self incite hate and justify hate and uh, when they don't condemn, you know, violence. And we saw it because when we were attacked, police didn't even want it to react in the beginning. So we were like for two, three minutes and police was very near. We, are, we were left alone until they saw that situation was going really bad and they had to, 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 to take some measures, you know. And um, the, 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 the situation in Albania, it's, uh, it's a little... Uh, different, but that doesn't mean that uh, when it comes to LGBT, uh, the government usually tries to use the cause a lot for pinkwashing. And uh, you see that when the prime minister and other ministers meet foreigners, they are very open with them and they say we support LGBT, but they never have the courage to uh, support openly or talk about these issues openly in our country. And I think the same kind of situation is in Kosovo as well, and we saw it now with the introduction of the family code. Uh, that, uh, you know, when you talk about these issues that are uh, uh, very conservative for our society, there you see the, the, real, uh, the, the real aggressivity and the real thoughts of even those uh, politicians that tend to use our cause to look progressive, you know, because they know that uh, 
if they are populist in their countries, they are the support of their uh, uh, of the people of the country. But if they are, uh, you know, uh, open with foreigners, they have their support and they play like a ping pong game with our cause. And this is not right because we see that if we are where we are now with the rights of our communities, it's because. We have been part of this very ugly themes of uh, us being used for populism reasons or for looking beautiful at the at the foreigners and uh, when it comes to repression and you know other dynamics. What is worrying me now, actually in Albania, is the fact of. Um, religious groups that are getting the agendas from the evangelist churches in U.S. and right groups in U.S. and are bringing these agendas in other our countries, things that didn't exist before. Uh, I became part of a huge lynching, actually, uh, um, campaign two years ago when I started to uh, discuss about the case of uh, the first lesbian couple that had two kids. Uh, and what was problematic in that moment was not only the fact that uh, this issue was uh, manipulated by the media by, by creating a very wrong narrative that uh, me personally was asking for the word mother to be erased, uh, but you can imagine in a conservative country to uh, manipulate my words and say to the public that a lesbian is asking for the word mother to be erased. Like you automatically be, are a target of hate for the whole country, even the ones that maybe before were supportive towards you. And how this kind of narrative that was built by the media then was manipulated again by the religious groups for their own uh, benefit. And uh, you, you, you find yourself, you know, in the middle of uh, a media that should be neutral. And I was being invited in TV shows, and you could see that the journalist herself was keeping the part of the pastor. I was in a debate, for example, with Oral Nima. And that is, that is actually not right, because you are not in an in a equal position of, of discussion if you don't have a, a neutral media. And I see that the same is in Kosovo as well, and we saw that many religious groups, when the discussion for, for the family cult was introduced, took uh, the, the opportunity you know, to, to raise their voice and to create... It's not only the, 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 the case of raising a voice, they can say whatever they think uh, they don't like, but the fact is that they incite violence and they inspire vi violence towards the community. And it starts from the ones that are more active and more, more uh, publicly out, and it continues with violence, you know, in the ground. And we saw that in Serbia after the Pride as well, that even now the race of hate crimes has increased so much in the country, and uh, activists are still suffering all the, the hatred that was, was built by the government in, uh, in, in that period. Thank you, Jenny. Unfortunately, we are, we are witnessing many cases in the entire Western Balkans uh, and attack, critical and verbal attacks against the activists. Um, I want to open the floor for the question or comments uh, before going to the second round of the question and to have an opportunity if anybody uh, wants to ask a question and also, for example, that have been advised uh, during the time. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. My name is Vedran Jinic. I'm from the Engage Democracy Initiative. Uh, thanks for the inputs. Uh, and I think we see quite obviously that there is a huge problem. Uh, uh, and that's clear. I would say and argue that in certain political regimes, and the mic doesn't go, go uh, like Serbia, which clearly can be described as a competitive authoritarian regime with a strong uh, rule of the governing party, uh, this problem is more uh, uh, systematic uh, and entrenched uh, into the, let's say, governmentality or common sense of the society. So I think uh, here the question is how to address it, basically, in an environment like in a small city of Novi Pazar where you have uh, students, young people 
thought to be disciplined, to listen, to live in a hierarchical system, etc., etc., and I think there is uh, probably a need for a common solidarity effort of solidarity uh, from other cities but also from the region to address these kind of uh, deep-seated issues. Uh, uh, but then uh, obviously Kosovo, uh, for example, uh, uh, is proud of uh, being more free and more democratic uh, uh, than Serbia in direct comparison. So here the question is how to address the authorities and create an alliance that can prevent uh, these cases. And my question to all of you will be, uh, in either of the cases, uh, what are the alliances that we can create and who are the possible supporters and partners in this uh, endeavor? I mean, what about the European Union? Uh, what about the member states of the European Union? How much they can be used to exercise an influence on, our, on authorities? And, uh, and this is the first question. The second one, uh, how much do you think that the regional solidarity among activists, uh, civil society members, etc., etc., can can help and exercise the pressure uh, on, on, uh, in cases of low suits and, and intimidation, etc. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, first, maybe just to reiterate, because this is really important and necessary, that uh, slaps are an attack to freedom of expression. Um, they are an attack. Um, and in fact, there are abuse of legislation, and there are abuse of the right to access courts. And when something like this, like this happens, I don't think any of us, in various capacities, have the luxury to sit and hope that this will go away. This is what a lot of journalists thought five years ago, and the situation did not improve. It became worse. If we were to discuss this topic five years ago, I think it would be very difficult to identify a case. Not that there were no cases, but simply because we had less knowledge, people talked less about this. And so now we are where we are, and I think the first thing to say is that all of us, in various capacities, need to discuss and address slaps. If you are an activist, if you are a lawyer, if you are a judge, if you are a prosecutor, first, we should be aware, and secondly, um, if not address it, at least to try not to do more harm. Mm. And this is valid especially for lawyers, judges, uh, prosecutors, and those who are involved in uh, legal proceedings in, in various capacities. Now, I think in terms of addressing and if we want to seek solutions, I think the first thing that I would say is how important it is to document slaps. This is because, and I know this from the work we do with ECPMF and the case, when we go and we meet with different prime ministers or uh, ministers of justice and we address slaps, the first thing they say, show me the data. We met with Eddie Roma three years ago and we complained how journalists are being attacked there and his question was, show me the data. And it was very difficult to show the data because journalists in Albania are, to a po they are in, at a point where they feel it's not even worth documenting and complaining about this. So I cannot reiterate enough how important it is to document uh, slaps. To document them using Council of Europe platform and safety of journalists, to document them using mapping media freedom, and to document them by uh, uh, working with uh, local non-governmental organizations, be that the associations of journalists or other civil society uh, organizations. Secondly, this goes without saying, but I will still uh, say, uh, say it. It's easier for good lawyers, who, those who are on the side of, of activists and journalists, to defend and to represent um, responsible journalists and responsible activists. You need to have your facts right. This is not always possible, mainly due to lack of transparency. But you need to show that you put enough efforts to verify information because you, before you publicly accuse somebody about corruption, mismanagement, etc. This makes the life of, of especially lawyers and civil society organizations much easier. Thirdly is practical support. 
Now, you cannot just sit and say, oh, this happened to, let's say, Front Online, which is an online media outlet in, in, in Kosovo, which is being sued by Jiko. Jiko is a so-called famous singer. This is what they say about him. Um, so basically, Front Online reported, based on indictment, how this singer is uh, accused of raping a young woman. So it was basically an information which was based on the uh, uh, in indictment, and he sued not only this media outlet, but whoever mentioned his name, because he was hoping it will go away. In fact, it created stress and effect. So more people got to know about, about uh, him. So in cases when this happens, you can't just say to um, front online journalists, oh, sorry, this happened. They need first and foremost money to pay lawyers' fees. And there are funds available across Europe to help uh, journalists. Um, they need pro bono lawyers. And again, we have here, uh, Rina, there are quite a lot. I'm not uh, inviting everyone to, to, <laughs> to, to, to contact you, but uh, she is an example of, 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 in, in how she supports activists and, 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 and journalists. And we need more um, activist um, lawyers who are uh, willing to, to, to help uh, uh, journalists. We need solidarity. Uh, we need to react as fast as possible when this happens because the, the experience I have from monitoring a lot of cases is that when journalists and activists do good work, everybody's behind them. When they're sued, well, for some reason, a lot of friends are busy, they don't pick up phones, uh, media outlets, owners, they try to not associate themselves with, with that. So you need civil society organizations who are strong enough and courageous enough to, 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 to name a, a lawsuit slap when there are slaps and to go publicly and defend them. Um, and this solidarity should be ongoing and it should be in collaboration with local international organizations. I put the emphasis on international organizations because from, for our politicians, and they are all the same more or less in the Balkans, if not everywhere, it met, these are people who have a lot of money, a lot of power, it, but it met, so it doesn't really matter what happens to them locally, but it matters when an international organization names and shames them publicly. So collaborating with platforms is really, really key. Now, sometimes you don't have the time, I know, but now the organization or collaboration between these organizations has improved, so all you need is to make sure that when something like this happens, to um, uh, uh, write some facts very briefly and then I think it's, it's easy to, to um, uh, disseminate. I'll conclude by mentioning, you mentioned international uh, institutions. Now, we complained until now what is happening, and the reason why we're, I think, here and why this topic has become so big is because there are initiatives at European level to address slaps. The European Commission, the European Parliament, the Council of Europe, OSC media representative, all of them, for the first time in our history, have said publicly that slaps are an abuse of legislation and judicial proceedings, legal proceedings. Moreover, there is a proposed directive from the European uh, Commission to counter slaps. There is a recommendation, which, by the way, all our countries should, start, should have started to implement it as of 27th of April this year. And there is a draft recommendation of the Council of Europe, which hopefully will be finalized next year. The main, the main aspect of this, uh, of, of this proposed legislation is to enable judges to dismiss lawsuits as quickly as possible. Now, of course, there is a, list, a long list of measures, but to simplify it for non-lawyers, it means that if now it takes 10 years for Crick to convince the judge that reporting from courts is really basic journalism, it's not even investigative journalism, it's basic journalism, this uh, proposed legislation would enable judges to quickly and immediately dismiss slaps as soon as they see that they, it has elements of, of slaps, which means on one hand you make sure that people have individuals have access to, to uh, uh, justice and at the same time um, when you see that this is a slap then the case is dismissed uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Ruta. Do you want to, to continue that a bit? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I, um, I think the, the key word um, that's been mentioned a couple of times here is solidarity. And I feel that this answers maybe the question of um, how we can address slaps in a country like Serbia. Because all of the examples I've mentioned, there is um, 
be, uh, in addition to um, how we've spoken about slaps so far is that uh, it's not about the outcome, it's about the process. It's the abuse of judicial proceedings um, through a baseless lawsuit and you're not interested in winning it, you're just interested in making life difficult for the person you're suing. But here we have a situation where we can't apparently count on uh, Serbian courts to uphold international standards uh, in the area of freedom of expression. Um, also there is, um, and I think, um, I, I think that um, um, we in the Western Balkans have um, a lot in common um, in uh, when it comes to to certain challenges um, related to uh, rule of law, um, also um, the relationship between uh, civil society uh, and the government. And I think that that makes it uh, difficult to do advocacy in the way that uh, case does and to address uh, slaps through through legislative means. What we found uh, to be the most uh, efficient tool against slaps at, at this stage in that sort of environment is um, solidarity. It's spotlighting individual cases and essentially turning uh, the spotlight on the slapper, on the person who um, filed the slap lawsuit because of what Flutura mentioned, which is um, there There are several aspects. One is, um, this may sound like a, an extreme statement or um, an unfair comparison, but um, it's what's been found in, in uh, some research, uh, a colleague, uh, Iva Markovic, who, uh, did, uh, who researched slaps against environmental activists in, in Serbia in the past period, she found that a lot of them didn't um, have not come forward due to experiencing the same types of feelings as victims of sexual harassment, that the psychological effect of, of slap lawsuits is similar in the sense that it makes you feel ashamed, it makes you feel isolated, especially when it's something to do um, with criminal proceedings, you've been charged with a crime and so on. And, and at, in that sort of atmosphere, the most important thing we can do is um, as civil society to stand behind that person um, and to show them that they're not alone, that they're supported to, like Futura said, to call slaps out for, for what they are. And in that sense, I think it's very important to network nationally. We have, um, I feel an efficient network in, in uh, Serbian civil society. Um, we're also working on forming a, a, a national working group uh, against SLAPS. Um, we, as Civic Initiatives, the organization I'm from, we're a part regionally of the Balkan Civil Society Development Network. We've uh, identified SLAPS as, as a sort of emerging trend and, and threat in our latest regional report. Um, and finally, there's case. So at the at the European level. So I would encourage any and all forms of networking and working together to, to um, address slaps, both through advocacy and as well, I feel it's very important through um, spotlighting individual cases um, because um, at its core, uh, a slap is a it's, a, it's a calculated PR move. You're trying to bury someone in lawsuits so they don't make something public. And by putting public pressure um, on people who abuse process in this way, we can make it so it doesn't pay off for them to um, try to silence criticism in that way. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, if you want to respond. Yeah. Yes, I think solidarity is always the answer, but to go there, it's not easy. And I think one, one, one thing f as a start is to dismantle the mentality that there is a hierarchy of human rights. Because that I see a lot in our countries, and that I see a lot being used by governments as well, because they want a weak civil society. And they want to put us, you know, in fighting with each other and... and, and seeing which one of our rights is it's more important. Uh, as long as we don't solve this issue, I think it's going to be very difficult for us to go somewhere. And as well, I would like to say that it's, it's very important to... I come from very grassroots experience, uh, very much community work all my life, and the only uh, way to get to have a strong civil society is to work with your community, like us with LGBT community, you with journalists, Roma community, every other community. 
movements are not made by organizations. Movements are made by empowered people. So it's very important to give the power to our people and for them to use this power. And uh, another, another thing that I would like to say is that uh, building alliances it's a response. I've seen it with the LGBTI movement in Albania, and for many years we had a lot of, an amazing uh, alliance with the media, for example, and it helped a lot. But what I see right now is that media is totally controlled by p politics and by oligarchs, and it's very important to try and build an independent media because I think that without media, a society, you know, is, uh, is, is kind of uh, dead. And without the, the, the only medium to have the truth and to bring the truth in a society, it's, it's a strong independent media. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, I think Lutra will go earlier, so I will use the opportunity to ask you a question, but shortly, I think here it's very important to rethink about the solidarity because uh, recently we are using a lot this word and I think that now is a, a time to, to sit together and to redefine what solidarity means for all of us because it's, it started to, to, I mean, we are kind of... Um, not misusing, but we don't use as a, in the same definition what solidarity means for all of us. So I think this is important when we are talking for the solidarity among the activists. So as uh, Flutra will go earlier, I want to ask um, in the uh, slab cases, uh, what are the main mechanisms, as you mentioned in the earlier, what are the slab cases, what are the main mechanisms to fight against the slab cases? As we saw that the, uh, the slab cases are used as a tool not from just local companies, but also from a company companies coming from European Union countries. So also we saw the case in Kosovo, but also in Serbia. Uh, in Serbia we have, I think, cases, but also in Bosnia and Herzegovina we have the cases, um, uh, the slap, how the slap case uh, has been used against um, activists and journalists. Yes, uh, thank you. I do apologize for, for having to, to leave. There is a um, there is a delegation of Council of Europe uh, uh, platform members um, on safety of journalists who are in Kosovo and they will be in Albania for, for a week and slaps are one of the points that will be addressed. Now on how to fight back, I think that's your question. Uh, I already mentioned some of the elements, but first and foremost, um, let me just mention the work that is being done with the European anti slap Coalition against um, uh, on, on slaps. This is a coalition which was uh, built by uh, initially a, gr a small group of I individuals. It started after Daphne Caruana Galicia was assassinated in Malta in 2017. Um, with some colleagues in other organizations, uh, we've been uh, very active in, in Malta in following cases around her, be that criminal or civil cases. Uh, so when she was assassinated, uh, there was a lot of uh, um, information emerging about her, and one of the information was that she had 47 active defamation lawsuits. It was very, it was shocking. It was really uh, unbelievable to to um, to hear that. A journalist uh, who was uh, operating on her own, she had her own uh, blog, she was not working for a media outlet, had um, this uh, number of, of, of lawsuits. So the first question we asked, and we were around five people at that time, we said, okay, is this a problem across Europe or is this a problem that only Daphne was um, uh, facing? And we needed two years to, to realize that basically it was a problem across Europe but it was just that uh, journalists and activists were not talking about it. They felt and still feel embarrassed because if you write an article and then somebody sues you, automatically a question mark is put to that investigation, which means that it creates confusion and the message to the public, those who are not uh, lawyers, those who don't understand maybe in investigative journalism very uh, in, in details, they would start thinking, well, whether this, per this journalist lied or, or not. So it puts a question mark. And then uh, for this, for, for journalists, is very damaging already. So most of them decide, decide not to speak about it, it, hoping that it will go away. And this mentality um, has started to, to change, um, but very, very uh, slowly. I know now, because I'm active on anti slav that more and more journalists are being open about it, but this was not the case a few years uh, ago. Uh, so the case coalition um, was created, uh, I'm uh, uh, proud uh, 
a co-founder of, of the coalition. We started with five, six people just discussing with each other. We realized we needed to document cases, so we put a lot of efforts on, on that. And next uh, uh, thing to do was to mobilize European institutions. And we were lucky enough to have the support of Daphne's family, Matthew and her sister Corinne, who, who used the, the, the assassination of, of their family member basically to advocate for, for uh, 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 anti slap And the result in a matter of five years is really positive and surprising because usually it takes up to 10 years to mobilize, especially the European Commission, to come forward with, with legislation. This took less time because of, 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 of Daphne, what happened to, to her, and all European institutions reacted, which I already mentioned, European Union, European Parliament, Council of Europe, OSC media representative. Now, the first thing that we need is legislation, because that will have an impact at national level. Even in, in Kosovo and in Serbia, it does not matter that we are not a member of the European Union, because there are instruments which obliges us to, to respond and to implement and tra to transpose the legislation. So that is very important. Um, and we need soft laws like recommendations to guide member states how to deal with slaps. But above all, we need political will to address slaps. Um, I don't know, but I'm pretty, pretty sure that if you ask our Minister of Justice or Serbian Minister of Justice or someone in, in Albania, what are you doing to counter slaps? I doubt they have a concrete answer. Now, whether it's because of lack of time or lack of expertise, I don't know. But I don't, I don't have, so the information I have is that there, there is no single uh, uh, step being taken in order to address slaps. And if there is no political will, then it means that we will be just us as civil society and activists um, uh, countering them in a very limited uh, 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 manner. But we have, we, it's very important, and this is also what was asked before, it's very important not to forget one thing. It is the state responsibility to create an environment where activism and journalism is possible. Now, we can speak to each other. We agree 100% with, with each other. We know what should be done, but it's not our responsibility. We can help our co community. We can help activists, etc. It's state responsibility to address slaps and everything that ob creates obstacles for journalism and activism and public participation. And as long as you don't have concrete actions, it means that you don't have a government, you don't have people in power who are interested to address this. Thank you very much, Lutra. Um, I will open again the floor for the audience if they, anybody has a yeah, please. Um, yeah. um, hi, uh, I'm Noel Musa, an activist for human rights uh, in Kosovo. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I want to, to, uh, to make a question to Tara and to Jenny uh, regarding uh, two different topics that were mentioned. Uh, regarding the situation in Serbia with the slap lawsuits. Uh, we have seen that in Kosovo, Amnesty International has reacted in June 2021 uh, for the lawsuits, the slap lawsuits against uh, Adria, Adriate Gazzafere and Spresa Ljoshai, but has someone from uh, the Serbian civil society or activists or lawyers addressed these lawsuits to international bodies or human rights organizations. And uh, regarding the question to Jene, uh, I didn't hear about this uh, new defamation uh, law in Albania. And was this, uh, if this makes uh, infrastructure to uh, for slaps to be easier towards uh, journalists and towards activists, uh, was this law addressed to international bodies uh, like the Venice Commission or the Council of Europe or anywhere else? Uh, so, yeah, this is, these are my questions. Thank you. So if I understood correctly, your question was, have we tried, um, when it comes to slap cases in Serbia, to uh, address them through an international body? Um, so uh, we haven't necessarily, um, we haven't had um, the maybe, 
maybe there is an opportunity to do that, but we've not um, attempted to do that through maybe UN mechanisms or through the Council of Europe or through an official institution. But when it comes to um, international organizations, because you you mentioned Amnesty International, uh, I mean, uh, Creek, um, the Creek case was addressed through case. There were. Um, um, Multiple, for example, Reporters Without Borders, um, the uh, Institute for Free Press, and so on, who who reacted and gave their um, support to to uh, Creek. The um, I, I would say that the issue the, the, that hasn't prevented um, support um, is uh, in a way because um, this is the first instance verdict, um, and uh, Creek is going to file an appeal, and the appellate court is going to decide on it so uh, I would say that if um, an institution uh, tried to address this by saying this is how you have to rule in this case that that would be problematic so it's not um, it's more informal public pressure through international institutions than going through maybe a special rapporteur um, the UN special rapporteur for freedom of expression or the Council of Europe Uh, yes, there was a lot of reaction against this uh, law that was presented from civil society. They also took it to the Venice Commission that, you know, came back with a decision that this is an absurd law. And uh, I don't know to tell the truth where it is now because I'm not a lawyer and a journalist, but uh, it, it, it had a lot of discussions in the country. And also, it, it didn't have international supports. It has a lot of critics from all international structures. Thank you. Anybody else? No comments? No question? OK. Um, then. Uh, Super clear. OK. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I will co continue with more question um, to Tara. Uh, what do you think um, that these regional and national networks and also shared knowledge for all slap cases can, can, can actually help activists to fight back and to find maybe more effective uh, mechanism to fight against the slap cases? Um, I feel like um, I've, I, I don't want to repeat myself because I think I, I said some of this in response to Vedna's question, but I feel I'm always for networking um, because I, I think it's a... Um, we've mentioned that maybe solidarity is a word that gets thrown around a lot, but I, I just wanted to give a, maybe a concrete example. Um, of the cases I mentioned, um, I mentioned the the, the case of uh, Aladdin Pochin. It's from Novi Pazar, who is being sued by the director of the hospital, um, because Civic Initiatives, the organization I'm from, we're a part of Case, and we're the national focal point for for Serbia. We um, nominated uh, so um, this year, uh, Case organized the um, uh, second, I think, annual uh, European uh, slap contest, which is modeled after Eurovision. It's sort of it's imagined as a fun event um, that names and shames people who use slaps to, to silence criticism, criticism and activists. Um, and during the first round of nominations, we nominated these two cases I brought up from, from Serbia. And they didn't even make the cut to be the official publicly announced nominees, but we um, presented that on our website. And the response we got from uh, activists in Novi Pazar just for the fact that we brought this up uh, to case, which is a which is a European network of um, big organizations, um, was so positive, and they felt so encouraged just to know that um, they're being uh, listened to, and that their um, concerns can be sort of upstream to to a network of such organizations. So I think it's there's a very um, important role uh, of um, having these these networks and being able to um, publicize uh, these slap cases uh, and shame those who who abuse slaps in that way. Uh, 
thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, I want to ask one more question for uh, for Jenny. You you act actually mentioned the, the your experience in uh, Europe right in Belgrade, but maybe a little bit to 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 tell us about your experience or how do you assess the cooperation among activists in the whole region that you had so far to to fight together against the violence and the threat that activists and also in intimidation that activists are facing on the ground. Yes, as I said before, uh, unfortunately, the situation is very similar, at least for the Balkans and Turkey. Uh, actually, we have a network of organizations that is called Year Era, and it's a network of organi uh, LGBTR organizations in the Balkan and in Turkey. And uh, thanks to that, we organize many activities and many conf joint conferences where we also discuss about what's happening in, in all our countries. And uh, the, the other part is, you know, to show solidarity at activities that are very visual as, uh, as prides. And due to that, we, this year we went in Belgrade, even though we knew very well that each of us, you know, could be a target there, and we we, we knew what could have happened. But still, I think it's it's very important, you know, to to show solidarity, and um, and and that was a case where you really understand what the term solidarity means. And uh, I think it's very important for us, you know, to. Uh, to be there with each other because, as I said before, when it comes at least for LGBTI rights, you see that uh, not many people from other civil society are, uh, are, are there for you, you know. And I see, for example, in our uh, countries the tendency that LGBTI activists are the first one to go in protests where a woman is killed or in protest for uh, Roma, environmental, and other issues, but that's not the case when we face you know, difficulties or when we need people to, to come and support us, and I think that is not, uh, that is not right. Thank you very much. Um, I, think, I, I think we are in, in the end of the panel. If anybody else is, is want to ask a question. Um, okay, uh, to wrap up, I think it's um, very important to have this discussion and this, this panel to share the experience. And we, are, we have a few actually, um, this kind of the panels, and we are, we are suffering from the same, and we are, uh, we are together in this fight. And also to see that actually the problems, social, economic problems that we are facing, all activists in the region are the same. And I think AD platform actually is doing the great job on bringing activists together and to share their experience, but also academia to come together. And I think the, the next also AD convention that will be in the May will be also the great example to, to share and to look uh, the way. Yeah, and to see. Okay. So, uh, so that will be that will be the great opportunity also to activists to come together and us to see the way forward what we can do uh, together. But also, I want uh, to to say um, in the end that it was very important what Vedran and Flutra said that that we are talking about the slap cases and this is the responsibility of the of the political level and political will and we don't hear that a lot from the political level, and it's the hand of the of, of the activists. So thank thank you all of you for your. Um, great work that you are doing on the ground and um, for your solidarity in the end that we, <laughs> we, we should uh, maybe re reconsider that work again. Thank you very much for all of you.